Welcome, everyone. This is Illiterate. My name is Evan. My name is Taylor. I read a book this week. I watched week. a show this week. This week we're doing Defending Jacob. It's a New York Times bestseller by William Landay, and it is a brand new series by Apple TV. It premiered just a few weeks ago. They dropped three episodes all at once, and now episode five actually comes out today, May 8th, if you're listening to this. So we're right in the middle of it. Right now, two hours ago, Deadline is talking that uh, Apple is reporting that this is their their biggest premiere since launch. Yet um, another streaming service for you to deal with. Oh god. But Evan said he didn't list. have to he didn't have to pay for it. No, it was incredibly easy. I was really like I was kind of dreading like having to like go in and like sign up for like a trial or something. But uh when I got there, I realized on my Apple TV I could just click play and I could click play for the first 3 episodes for totally free without signing up for anything. So it was incredibly easy actually to mm. to get this thing loaded up and then I saw you can you can go ahead and get that seven day free trial and finish the whole thing and then back out of it after if you so, don't want to yeah. stick around. So Apple um, is really I, it was really easy. They're using it as a gateway drug for people to start using their service. And the reason is because of the people involved in making this, because nobody or not nobody, but people know less about the book and this property. But the people involved are quite prestigious or are going out on a limb with different incredible roles. cast. First off, the, the lead is Chris Evans, Captain America. But this is a, a role that he, that you've never seen before. G- real quickly, the synopsis of this is uh, an assistant DA's world shattered when his beloved son is charged with murder. So Chris Evans plays the DA. And this takes place over eight hours. So seeing what drama lays before this character, that's that's a huge draw right there on its own. Is seeing Chris Evans actually take on a role with this kind of scale and scope. Backing him up, Michelle Dockery from Downton Abbey plays the wife. Jaden Martell plays the son in question. He leads it. He also stars opposite of Chris Evans in Knives Out that came out last oh, wow. year. A huge, uh, huge movie nominated for Best Screenplay. Also a hard role for a kid who may or may not be a murderer. Yeah. But is also just an angsty teenager. Big shoes to fill. I watched a, a little bit of an interview while they were uh, casting. They sent some auditions to Chris Evans. They had already cast Chris Evans and they were looking for the son. And he said that when he started playing the auditions, first one up was Jaden Martell. And he right off the bat goes, oh, weird. The kid is improvising. Interesting. That's brave. That's really brave. <laughs> Good for him. That's awesome. Next, the same words, but different. Very different. And he stops and he goes back and realizes that he was not improvising at all, that he's just off book and he's just that good. Wow. Uh, so that was <laughs> that was how they ended up landing on casting him was a, a bit of a nudge from Chris Evans saying like, well, this was pretty obvious mm-hmm. based on this alone, just wow. as an actor. But yeah. backing up the cast, Cherry Jones, she's also uh, she got an Emmy for Handmaid's Tale. She's in Signs, uh, one of my personal favorites from her. So who who is involved in making this? The other prestigious claims are the the writing and the directing. The director. Now, this is interesting. This is a big thing. This is all directed by one guy. Usually for series, uh, you, you know, some directors will d- direct multiple episodes, but usually they're passing around kind of an even spread here and there. You yeah. might get some people who are favored. This is all helmed by one man. His name is Morton Tidlam, director of Imitation Game, the movie about Alan Turing and the first computer code breaking first, yeah kinda, code breaking it, yeah. computer yeah in world war ii fantastic movie he also directed passengers i know that that got a bunch <laughs> of a bunch of pans and slams uh i never saw that so i i heard that the script was really great that was apparently one of yeah. the like most passed around unmade scripts in, right. in hollywood so, was so imitation who knows what game. happened to that sorry so was imitation game was really the was it really list, yeah. yeah oh wow and i did not realize got that got nominated fantastic. for the academy award for best director mm. Uh, yeah, Morton. He's all over it, man. And who who's on the writing of this? Writing is uh, Mark Bomback. So Mark Bomback is an interesting guy. He is responsible for the reboot of Planet of the Apes franchise we've seen over the last 10 years. He also wrote the screenplay for Racing in the Rain, the dog movie for you know that came out like a year or two ago. He, he wrote Insurgent. He didn't write all of the Divergent movies, but he wrote yeah. Insurgent. He wrote The Wolverine from 2013. He wrote... Unstoppable, I believe that's Tony Scott's mm-hmm. final movie with yeah. Denzel Washington. So uh, the, the director of Top Gun. Uh, <laughs> if you're catching a theme here in the types of big things he's writing, it's he's a huge, huge in Hollywood stuff. big live series. free die hard yeah. race to which mountain he's Hollywood Hollywood Hollywood. Uh, but when I when I'm looking over his creds here, I see this big action fire, you know, big <laughs> drama, that kind of stuff. 
I don't see anything that resembles what I'm actually watching in Defending Jacob. Defending yeah. Jacob feels uh, like... David fincher Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. 100%. So it's yeah. really amazing to see him writing and helming something so viciously serious. Yeah. This is going to probably be his crown jewel. I mean, an eight-part series with that cast. And, that, and that's part of the, the, kind of the energy of this episode. I suppose we're in the middle of it, and we really just... We do not yeah. know where the show is going to go because we have a good idea that the show is going to depart from the book. We just don't know exactly how, when, and yeah. why. And in the book, there is a framing device where Chris Evans starts out and he is involved in a trial, not to spoil anything, but you realize later in the show and in the book that this trial is a completely other thing separate from what's going on with the sun. So the whole thing opens up into multi-layered, we ambiguous- We think we're, we're d- taking apart the murder of a 14-year-old in a park. So we think we're talking about just one case. His son is implicated in it, possibly in the murder of this boy. So he is on the stand testifying to everything that happened, transpired but to, you know, in those events. There will be a massive transition where we realize that where what the case he is testifying on, recounting all these events we've been watching, is not about this 14-year-old in the park that was murdered. It's about an entirely different case. Um, so I'm really excited to see what they pull out here, but that is you're going to have the rug pulled out from you in the middle of this series. Uh, that's one thing we can warn you about without spoiling anything. Yeah, and that's what the book was praised for was – its level of ambiguity at the end, but also the second you put it down, it's like one of those classic book club, like, so let's talk about what in the world just happened. Yeah. But the series is still ongoing, so we're not going to talk about what we are going to talk about is who in the world came up with this, why this supposedly random, to me at least, book from 2012. Now is hot now on the this... scene 2020 with the biggest cast. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> How did this happen? What's going on? <laughs> why did it take so long? <laughs> right. Well, the uh, so like I said, the book came out in 2012. The author of this, William Landay, Looked into all his interviews and research and everything. Seems like a really nice dude. Just really humble, yeah. interesting guy. He served for seven years as the assistant district attorney for Middlesex County, Massachusetts. Well, he so was a district he attorney? He was the assistant district attorney. Yeah. Lawyers write lawyers in these <laughs> y'all. That's what? exactly what happens. Yeah. That's crazy. That's so, cool. Yeah. So does so does his uh, I don't mean to get you off track here, but yeah. does his work involve a lot of of lawyer stories or is he Yeah, is so this, okay. Yeah, so the, so he started out, he went to Yale and then Boston College School of Law, graduated in 1990, was part of the Lowell District Court, which is a part of that area in uh, mm-hmm. Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. He said it was an amazing experience because he described it as a short order cook mentality. There's just lots of different cases and it's all going on all the time. He said, you have to read the police report as you're walking up to the courtroom. So we just got a ton of experience wow. trying to litigate these different cases. Yeah. And sometimes it would be small things and sometimes it would be big domestic, yeah. you know, like it's yeah. all sorts of stuff, but it's just boom, here, you got to do this here, here, here. So he's getting all of that experience. He also heard something from a crime novelist that going over transcripts is a great way to learn dialogue because you're literally reading back oh, hours yeah. worth of what people are really saying to yeah. each other. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how he learned those elements in writing. But like I said, he had been doing this for seven years straight out of school, mm-hmm. tried to write novels in that span of time, and he wrote two and then abandoned them. But this is in between bartending, living on retirement, and then going back to DA work. So he gave it up for times to try the writing thing and then went back and forth between it. Okay. But it never really was his thing. But then he said when he turned 30, it was kind of like lawyers have an early midlife crisis (laughs) because they work so hard. So he's like, I want to write one published book. Like, that's all I want to do. You know? Good goal. Instead of buying a motorcycle or cheating on my wife. Good goal. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So he got, he also, he got married and the offer for his first book happened. He got the news in the obstetrician's office for having their first kid. Wow. So it all coincided. And uh, the big thing about him, so his first novel was called Mission Flats. It was awarded the best debut crime novel of 2003 by the British Crime Writers Association. Mm. And then he has another novel, which is set in Boston, but more in the past, like in the 60s or 70s. So it's more about crime and less about courtroom style stuff. Defending Jacob is his third book that came out in 2012. Ah. But his whole thing, he was just like, he's, I'm not rich, but I am making my living now as a full-time writer from those things. And he said the, the big thing with the first book was actually, people don't know this, it was a two-book deal. So that's what got him off to oh. the races. So he was like, well, if I do this one, then I have to do two. Yeah. 
So it worked out well, kind of bad that way. Into a perfect corner. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was like, no, I have to do this full time. <laughs> that's um, awesome. And now he's the third, and who knew God knows. Yeah. Well, that's what he that. said. Yeah. So he said on them goals, baby. Yeah. He said uh, he wants to make his living as a full time writer. He said, "quote I want to see a shelf of twenty or twenty five books." He said, "It's if writing has mm. taught me anything, it's not to compromise. I want to spend the next forty years wearing myself out after that goal." So he's just like in on it. He's like, "This is great. This is what I want to do. Aww. This is what I've learned." That's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's. I mean, I love hearing the kind of the struggle there. I mean, he's you know has a whole other career. Has a you know a third <laughs> you know in his thirties just thinking you know Wife, wants kids, this to work. Yeah. It, it can't work. He tries it a few times. I mean, it takes some trial and error to get these things going. And look, now he has a whole different life. Than, yeah. <laughs> than he did it when he was 29, you know, whatever. Yeah. An entirely different life, an entirely different source of income. And mm-hmm. I mean, just his life has totally changed. Yeah. And and it and it happened, you know, into his 40s. And like I said, from the, all the interviews, he doesn't seem like some pompous artist. He's just like a humble dude who lives in Massachusetts. Yeah. Likes writing these kind of stories, wants to get better at it. A film was optioned immediately. Like really? I found an interview that somebody did with him in April of 2012, and the book came out in, in January. Mm. And he was like, yes. So there was interest immediately. Hollywood has bought it as early as a couple months after the book came out. Interesting. But it Very took interesting. eight years yeah. for it to come out as a TV show. I mean, now. I know writing this thing would be an incredible undertaking, and that alone can take a couple years. But, yeah. you know, outside of, if I, you know, outside of like four or five years, good Lord. Yeah. Uh, so, and it was going to be a movie, or mm-hmm, if it, mm-hmm. it was going yeah. to be a feature film. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's also catching on the wave, which we'll get into uh, the ebbs and flows of legal thrillers in fiction, and how that kind of coincides with history and and tr- popular okay. trends and whatnot. But just as a, as a last little side note, he he went to training to be a, a DA, obviously in school, and he was saying the biggest thing he learned was you need to have the story of the case, like being. A district attorney or an assistant district attorney is a very narrative job. <laughs> you literally have to be like, hey, here's oh, the plot yeah. of this. How do I convince a jury of this and this and this and this with evidence? I mean, it's that's not just it right enough. there. Yeah. Is, that's their job is they have to convince somebody that this is what happened. Yeah. There's inherently storytellers. I love true crime. I love uh, I love watching all this stuff. I just finished the, uh, the Atlanta child murder. So I'm in on all this stuff. But when I watch these things, I cannot help myself but go... Man, maybe I could have been. Maybe I could have been a lawyer. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean it's silly, but I I find myself all the time because I obviously went down the storytelling route. Yeah. Uh, so, but I find myself, you know, it's a very similar to, skill set. You know, I, yeah. I, I I see so much of my training as a as a writer and a creative in there in places, uh, and it's it's fantastic to see. The application of storytelling. Yeah. When, when, if you're a storyteller, you're not just a writer. You're not just a, a creative. You're not just an artist. I mean, you could be a lawyer. I mean, that in itself is an art form if you can actually get people on your side, if mm-hmm. you can actually be that convincing, if you can sway a jury. Yeah. Uh, well, here's the here's the caveat to it. The uh, William Landay, he was saying in an interview, he was like, I realized like it was good fun and it was like you worked hard and you you felt like you were really in it. But he was like the second – the gavel hit and you left the courtroom, that story is gone. Mm-hmm. And he was really inspired by these books. And he's like, what What do I have to show in a hundred years? Everything I do just wisps away into the wind or gets locked in a filing cabinet. Mm-hmm. You know, like people's lives are affected by it, obviously. But he's like, I wanted to have something more something permanent. Something lasting, yeah. A story that is more fulfilling and, and rich and Some, be- Something more to hold. I mean, it's incredible to change people's life and do the work of justice. Yeah. I mean, you, you'd you have to be able to derive ultimate happiness from knowing you have done that. Yeah. It doesn't give you a lot to, to hold and a lot yeah. to share and a lot to, you know, it's hard to, honey, let me tell you about this murder case. You know, <laughs> <Right>. like, <laughs> so yeah. I understand after working on, uh, working so long for people, eventually mm-hmm. you want something of your own. We keep dredging that up throughout this show. Yeah. But you have got to take your life and where you've been and figure out a way to comport it into a story yeah. and and create something new out of it. So let's talk about legal crime fiction because I, I shout out to our other episode. We talked about detective fiction, episode 39, our Motherless Brooklyn episode. Mm, motherless Brooklyn. We've got a brief summary of the history of detectives in fiction. Yeah. But this is more focused. This all centers around a court case and is like the classic courtroom drama. Right. 
let's talk about some of these legal stories, where they came from, and how most of them are based on people that actually were involved in the business yeah. of law, yeah, which okay. is kind of crazy. The more I looked into it, I'm like, all the, all these people have been doing this. <laughs> That seems like the track. So first, cor- first courtroom drama, I believe we mentioned this already, but it's in A Thousand and One Nights. Oh, really? From, oh, a, yes. From Aladdin. Yes. They had like the first detective, the first science fiction, the first, this also has the first courtroom drama Man. that happens. But it doesn't really get big, at least in the Western world, until the 1700s. So there's a, a book called Famous and Interesting Cases by a French lawyer. And so it was a, a document of stories of various trials of the in the history of France and in his time as okay. a lawyer. Yeah. But he constructed it in such a way that the ending would not be known until the end and the clues were dis- you know it wasn't the legitimate just transcript. Mm-hmm. So he turned it into more of a storytelling the beginnings of the breadcrumb right. narrative. <laughs> right. An interesting facet of history, a very famous lawyer that people forget about, attorney Abraham Lincoln. He was a, he, <laughs> we forget about Mr. Attorney Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> yeah. He was a great admirer of Poe around this time, and he wrote really? a news story that was published in 1846. I'll post a link to it. It's called The Trailer Murder Mystery, Trailer being the last name of the guy. And uh, it's based on a case he defended in Illinois. So he is also a courtroom Abraham writer. Lincoln. Yeah. Getting in on that procedural. <laughs> <laughs> the OG. Um, The first person, though, to really do this, like we said, Edgar Allan Poe is not quite courtroom. The person to really do this is Wilkie Collins, a name that I don't know about. Wilkie Collins. Wilkie Collins. Wilkesboro, North Carolina. (laughs) From England, actually. Charles Charles Dickens was his mentor. So he is responsible for a lot of the detective tropes, a lot of the stuff that we see in in that world. Um, The Woman in White is the name of the first novel, and some people say it might be the first English novel to have the viewpoint of multiple narrators. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Where the story itself is like chapter one, Joe Schmo, chapter two, Susan, you know. Interesting. Interesting. It's bizarre that that had never been done. They take up that. that, I don't know that we even mentioned it, but Miss America is structured like that on Hulu. Each Mm -hmm. episode features uh, centers around a different character. Um, In America, after Abe Lincoln, 1878, Anna Catherine Green is known as the mother of American detective novels. So she, the, her famous book is called The Leavenworth Case. And she also mm. introduces a num- number of criminal case tropes mm-hmm. that we're now familiar with. But her father was a defense attorney. Oh. So she had some, I feel like Naturally. all these people have connections yeah. to law. Now we move into the 30s and 40s, these pulp stories, like we talked about before, where detectives right. are featured. The one that has least to do with detectives and most detective to do with lawyers no. <laughs> is called, the guy's name is Earl Stanley Gardner. And mm. you might have heard of Perry Mason, yeah. the famous <laughs> yeah. lawyer. So then that There's became- There's a series coming out about it. We'll again. probably be doing it. Wow. <laughs> so that was a bunch of famous books. And then it also became a black and white TV show that everyone knows about. Really? But it's, that's like, the, the, the ending is always the courtroom and it's some big <laughs> twist that the person who's innocent is actually guilty, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, like he's, okay, he okay. He did- hundreds of those things, but in the pulpy style. But he's really the onus for that in American fiction. Just as an odd fact, so his name, Earl, is spelled E-R-L-E, which is a very odd way to spell Earl. He has the highest- Earl. (laughs) Earl. (laughs) Looks like it sounds. He had the highest ratio of mentions in the New York Times crossword puzzle to the actual amount of times that he's mentioned in the New York Times. He's like a, a very popular- (laughs) <laughs> solution to crossword puzzles because what? it's four letters and it starts and ends with E. <laughs> Could you imagine? I'm the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to most things in the crossword puzzle. So if you're ever stumped in the New York Times, it might be this guy, Earl, who Earl. wrote Perry Mason. Earl. <laughs> yeah. Immediately after this, 1950s, 1958, Anatomy of a Murder, which became a very mm. famous movie. The famous poster is like the, the blocky arms and legs and body. Oh, yes, if You're yes. familiar with that? Yeah. So that- Became a film in 59, Academy nominated, was written by Michigan Supreme Court Justice John D. Volker. Hmm. He was a defense attorney on the case that then he turned into a book, Anatomy of a Murder, which then became the movie. A United States Justice. Yeah, who wow. was the defense attorney on that case. Wow. And then wrote the book. Immediately after that, 1960 is when To Kill a Mockingbird comes out, mm-hmm. American fiction, classic. 
Uh, Harper Lee's father was a defense lawyer in a case similar to the one that happens I didn't even know in that. To Kill a Mockingbird. I didn't even know that. Yeah. <laughs> I did not know that. That's amazing. God. And the that echoes. Happened. The echoes, they're there and they reverberate. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's sort of a, a, I think it shifts with the economy or at least how lawyers are feeling at the time because the ah. only bigger piece that comes out in between the 60s and the early, into the early 90s is Helter Skelter. Oh, which we talked about, which yeah. is written by a lawyer. With the economic bust of the 80s, then we get back into, oh, lawyers are disenfranchised with their work. You know, because <laughs> oh, yeah. the 80s were the like corporate business, like that's all yeah. what your life Wall is. Street, yeah. Now lawyers are like, well, maybe I don't want to do this anymore. So the big book that comes out is in 87, and it's called Presumed Innocent. Some people say that this is kind of the spiritual successor to this, dis- defending Jacob, really? because it's about a prosecutor who is accused of murdering his colleague. Oh, that's And then he's the one that is taking the blame. So it's got the echoes of that. Definitely. Very similar in a Um, a, a way. Yeah. And that the author, Scott Turo, was the assistant US attorney for the city of Chicago. Wow. And so then he wrote that. It's actually like heartening me to learn that, you know, (laughs) all these, you know, legal, you know, shows and stuff and books are, you know, are are coming from people who, you Mm -hmm. know, would know. (laughs) And are good at writing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So that I'm like, I've I've wondered, you know, watching uh, Law and Order. Yeah. You know, like, well, how do you how do you know that's how it would be? You know? <laughs> oh, because you did it. So I just have to get to the, the last one, the big one that everybody knows. Mm. John Grisham ah, from the nineties. Nineteen eighty nine was his the first book came out, but the big one was the firm, which came out in ninety one. It's crazy because the nineties seem to be the, the epicenter of this illegal thriller. And mostly in relation to John Grisham. So 1994 had three legal political thrillers in the box office, The Client, Clear and Present Danger, and Disclosure. Uh. 1993, the year before, also had three as well. What's odd about this is the last legal thriller to- Was he competing with Michael Crichton? Yeah, yeah, kind of. (laughs) This is that same time, basically. Yeah. (laughs) They're balling out on each other. Yeah. (laughs) It's a boom. But the last, from what I could find, the last time a legal thriller reached the same level, even in the top box office 15, was Aaron Brockovich in 2000. Ah. So for 20 years, we've been in kind of this gap. Although law, you know, TV shows maybe have subsumed that more than movies. But it is interesting how this ebbs and flows in history as the legal profession gets more or less disenfranchised yeah. with their work. It's funny you mentioned Aaron Brockovich. There's something about the uh, the poster for that movie is seared in my mind. Mm-hmm. It, coming out in 2000, I just remember it as a child. That's something I've never seen in the movie, but because I just had this memory yeah. that won't go away, it's always kind of been on my list. I've never yeah. even known what it was about. Yeah. So n- next time I'm looking for a legal thing, now I know kind of what to hit up. It's something <laughs> yeah. I've wanted to do just because I wanted to know what it was. Yeah. So that's, that's interesting. That's on the tail end of that trend. Yeah. I'd like to uh, touch on, just at the very end here, some of the themes and a big portion of this, not to spoil anything, is the scientific basis for this because the central conflict of defending Jacob revolves around this kid who may or may not have killed another kid. And then the J.K. Simmons character is the guy's dad. The, the J.K. The, Simmons plays the DA's father. Father, yeah. And the, the idea is that Chris Evans, the DA, has been holding a, a dirty secret from his family, but from both his wife and his son. About violence as a his... generational thing in their family. So that's the question that then, can this get brought up in court? Is it a nature versus nurture thing? Is there? They mention this thing called a murder gene which I had never heard of, which seems absurd. Yeah, I'd never heard of that either. That almost seems like a gobbledygook for drama. <laughs> right. And it <laughs> gets a lot of contention. So where I found William Landay was talking about, where he came upon this idea, uh-huh. was from a 1997 Esquire article, and I'll post a link to it, of course, about this three generations of people. There was a convicted grandfather, a cop father, and then a murder suspect Whoa. who was the son. Whoa. And they were saying, oh, it skipped a generation. And they use the phrase murder gene in that article. So how many people can be arrested for this murder? <laughs> right. <laughs> who's, who's at fault? Yeah. So the thing that he- Sir, do- you're genetically responsible. Yeah. <laughs> Go to jail with your son. With your and son. Your All three of you. Yeah. <laughs> Where does it Round end? Round them up. <laughs> so the, there is a legitimate scientific basis for this. There is a monoamine oxidase A or MAOA. And that's what's Mm. mentioned in the book, Defending Jacob, when they consult a psychiatrist who does tests on the kid. Interesting. And it it creates an enzyme deficiency. The actual syndrome that you could get 
for this, which is very, very rare. Yeah. Um, but if it's like you're le- you legit have this uh, deficiency, it's called Brunner syndrome, and it's characterized by lower than average IQ and impulsive behavior. Mm-hmm. Though you could just have, even though if you don't go as far as having the syndrome, you could just have this deficiency, and it does create aggression and impulsiveness in people, specifically oh men. Yeah. So it does factor in. I don't know. I mean, sounds like something I wish I heard about more often that people were actually, you know, trying to get to the bottom of and trying right. to really uphold and, and and figure out as real science. There because is, yeah, honestly, I'll, like both of us, I think, saw that and went no. Right. <laughs> like, so th- this is all based in some sort of real science. Yeah, and and I can see uh, just based on the 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 bare facts here. Oh, well, there might be something to it. Right. Uh, so I wish that I wasn't learning about this on, you know, defending Jacob. You know, like right. I, w- <laughs> I wish that this is something that was like a big discussion and was like in all these true crime doc series on Netflix and Hulu and all these things, you know, that were yeah. like, can't, not that murder exclusively would be uh, perpetrated through somebody by with this gene, but that if it's more likely that this gene leads to yeah, uh, a well, and that was act. a lot of the a lot of the studies, and I'll post some a link to it. Is like the stats that they did and the research that they it, it also accounts for the fact it's like the children that did this and then had this were also abused as kids. Yeah. It's like yeah. it, it is a complete it's, thing. It, it'd be interesting if you could actually find the gene and track it and and get the people the help and 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 nurturing they need before anything goes wrong. Because it seems <laughs> right. like something that if you know, yep, they have the gene. We need to, you know, be nicer to, you know, like, yeah. you know, like there are certain, there are programs we need to do, you know, like we, Where it's we he connect, has a deficiency. Yeah. We've got to attain by, this is how you take care of somebody that has a deficiency or yeah. else he might go crazy and murder us all. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I the, wish that we were like at that level in society that we could actually talk about if it was possible to find out uh, that this has a direct, real, scientifically backed linkage. Yeah. I mean, it obviously isn't wholesale the murder gene and you will murder right. somebody. <laughs> right. But you could pre- act, preemptively identify risk. Yeah. At, at I think minimum, that, that just is minimum, more, identify yeah. risk. That is more of the question than like, okay, this thing happened. Now, what is the sentencing for this person? Like, it's like an insanity plea or whatever. It should, that's where the issues in the court comes mm-hmm. in from what I've seen. It hasn't been involved in the US, but there was an Italian man in 2009 who got a reduced sentence because of this. But right. it is very, very questionable in the courts because the, the questions and the criticisms that get brought about is like, okay, where mm-hmm. where is the culpability? And this guy was saying it's like 90% of all murders are committed by people with a Y chromosome, males. Mm-hmm. So should we give always just give males a reduced sentence because it's the Y chromosome? No, is, you know, see, like no, where uh, we reduce sentences and get his response. I, I, I go to treatment. Preventative. Yeah, yeah, preventative treatment. How can we identify and, and mitigate risk? If we know that somebody needs more attention in an emotional area or has the potential, we can put them to. in a program and yeah. help that. Yeah. You know, that's very. That's doable. Yeah. Uh, so that's a lot of the questions that get brought up in the show and the book is like, oh, is he just an angsty teenager? Oh, no, he does have this gene in him. But obviously, it's like it does. the dad is fine, too. Mm-hmm. And is the dad culpable for raising his kid wrong? You know, like, where does it? It's a very murky thing, which brings up a lot of questions in this series, which is why it's being made now. But it is not a wholesale. If you, like you said, if you have this thing, you're going to kill people or you're even no, going to be violent all. or it, aggressive. It's the potential might exhibit to exhibit no, you right, know, you, right. you, you, you could have it and have no idea and have no, you know, be uh, right as rain at all. Yeah. yeah. So again, I don't I want to state that clearly that it's not a fix all for murder, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, Hey, something we could really think here about th- the here, science yeah, behind here, it. Here are things that could be warning signs yeah. or could lead to another personality disorder yeah. because of these deficiencies or because of the way that this is done. Well, we're in the middle of this show. We don't know where it's going. They're going to divert from the book. We just don't know how far. And honestly, as it stands, no idea. I really don't know where it's going and I'll be excited to, to watch the rest of it. So go check it out for free on Apple. It was super easy to do, as I said yeah. before. So. I don't know. Uh, nature versus nurture. Dark, tragic, fascinating, confusing. Teen violence and paranoia. And well, we don't have being the a good parent. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, Things to think about. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thanks for sticking with us. Yeah.